Gary Peterson, and you're watching uh, Cure Talks with Gary. And uh, I am so pleased today to have uh, Dr. Ola Langren on the program. He has to be my doctor, and I've chosen him for a number of uh, great reasons. Let's just say uh, that uh, he has a lot of uh, some of the best background in the entire world. Um, when I I have myeloma, and um, when I first uh, got myeloma, I uh, decided to have uh, go to who I thought was the best myeloma specialist in the world at the time, and that happened to be a Dr. Bart Barlogi at uh, UAMS, and he did all his under all his work uh, at uh, MD Anderson. Now, I've, he was at uh, UAMS, I went there, so did a number of other uh, patients, and, and I come to understand what a great uh, facility that was. And uh, he went to Mount Sinai, and when he did that, I followed him. So if I get a great doctor, I'm not gonna just sit around, I'm gonna follow that doctor, because uh, he's keeping me alive, and I've been alive now for 14 years, almost 15 since my diagnosis, so I'm very pleased. But Dr. Uh, Barlogi left uh, and went to Mount Sinai and I followed him there. Uh, at that point he retired. And when he did, I went and looked and uh, chose um, another outstanding and great doctor. And that happened to be Dr. Langren from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And now he decided to move to Miami. And so I followed him to Miami as well. Dr. Langren has an excellent background and experience in cancer research, and he started it, and not started it, but um, he uh, studied in Sweden, and uh, that's why uh, <clears throat> not only is he uh, very excited about uh, um, working uh, with myeloma, but he found out recently that Abba is coming out with a brand new album, and that pretty much excited him more than one could imagine. But um, what uh, he did after he was at the National Institute of Health, he went to and, and was the director of myeloma at uh, the program um, for, uh, at uh, Memorial Sloan. And it's one of the two best cancer centers in the uh, United States. And if you also search, you'll find that it's one of the best cancer centers in the world, one of the two best cancer centers of the world. And so, um, you know, he set up and, and improved on that program. And at least I saw that as well as that uh, when, I, uh, when I make a transition from one to the other, it seemed like it wasn't seamless. It's not just the doctor that um, makes the program, it's the program and it's engineering and how it becomes seamless that makes the program um, but obviously the doctor is a key, key component. So uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Nimmer happens to be from Memorial, he's an alum of Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he heads up the program at Sylvester. And I've chosen uh, Dr. Or, uh, Dr. Langren as a, a person he felt could bring uh, them to uh, a level like either Anderson or Memorial Sloan Kettering. So he, he was uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering and he chose Dr. Langren. And, uh, and so that's what, um, what their plan is at this point. But the one thing I wanna know is uh, the, the new uh, program that he has is, um, is 51, if you look at US News and World Report, Sylvester is at 51, which is not so bad when, based on the thousands that there are. And, uh, and I guess the one thing I need to ask you to begin with is just like Barlogi, he went from the, the best to one that probably nobody heard of at UAMS. And here you are going from number two to number 51, which is probably significantly better. So I'm gonna have to ask you, like I did Barlogi when I was with him, is what the heck were you thinking? 
first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here today, Gary. It's, it's a great honor and a pleasure. And as usual, we are having a lot of interesting discussions here aside from health management. So um, what was I thinking? Well, as you briefly here uh, reviewed my background, I, I've been trained my entire life at uh, these institutions that are kind of very, very competitive. I did my MD, PhD at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. I moved to the NCI. I was there for 10 years. And then I was recruited to Sloan Kettering. I was there for almost seven years. So I think what I felt was that we were doing so extremely well at Sloan Kettering, but I also felt that over these years, uh, I hopefully have learned how to build teams and what it really takes to establish the top quality that all these institutions have trained and, and taught me how to do. So I felt it was a new challenge for me, and it was a new opportunity uh, for me as a leader uh, to establish a program. And I was also thinking, Florida is the third most populated state in the United States. Uh, you have California and Texas and Florida, those are the top three most populated states, but there is really not a big myeloma center in Florida. So I was thinking not only would it be a challenge for me, it would also be a big contribution for patients that live in Florida to have access to top of the line care. So I thought about it back and forth a lot when Steve Neimer reached out to me, uh, as you pointed out, uh, Norton Neimer was with Sloan Kettering for almost 25 years. And he was recruited to make the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center here in Miami, an NCI designated cancer center, which is a top tier cancer center uh, kind of hallmark. And he is the one who made the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center NCI designated. That happened about two years ago. So when he reached out to me, he did several times, he tried to talk me into moving. And I said, I'm never leaving New York. And when he came <laughs> back to me and he said, there is a life well, after that didn't New work. York City. <laughs> he said, there is a life after New York City. I said, I don't know, where would that be? He said, it would be in Miami. And he said, you can build a, a top program here and you will also uh, have a second job. So you will also lead the establishment of an experimental therapeutics program that goes across all the cancer diseases within the cancer center. So I was thinking maybe this is the right moment really for me to, to take on this new challenge. So I made a decision to come to Miami and I'm very happy here. Uh, I've been given a lot of support. Uh, I've been able to bring a lot of people with me from New York City. Uh, and I also hired people from other institutions. I hired probably 15 or so people from top institutions in New York. I hired people from Washington, DC. Now I hired uh, another top class doctor from the Fred Hutch who is joining me. And there are people from Boston that are coming and other places as well. So I think we are definitely on the roll. And I think the brief, this is the long answer. The brief answer to your question what was I thinking? I actually think that in order to establish a world-class program, you need, to have, uh, you need to have experience, you need to have energy and vision. But what you don't need is like hundreds and hundreds of people. You actually can do probably top of the line care and research with a group of say 20, 30 people. And that's about what we are trying to establish here. So I already have a team of about 20 people here. And our ambition is to become one of the top three myeloma programs in the United States within five years. And we are so far right on track. And I'm very, very excited. So that's my answer back. Well, I, you know, and one of the things that uh, I think is important in, in uh, any myeloma center is that it, there's a continuity. Uh, in the program that uh, that it's patient centered, that it's uh, focused on the disease as well. And and what I found is that at at uh, at all of the locations that I've been in the past, although it may not have been to begin with, like with you at Miami, I was probably as disappointed as I could be. Uh, when I first made that transition, because it seemed like there was um, 
there, you know, there just wasn't the same level of uh, seamlessness that I came to expect from Memorial, from, from my care uh, leaders. And, um, and, and with that, I, 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 I was very open with you about that and that uh, I had sent you a number of uh, patients in the past and, and I didn't feel that they were getting the same level of uh, care, you know, not necessarily care from you, but certainly, you know, uh, care, uh, you know, from a consistent, ongoing, you know, myeloma-centered, patient-centric uh, position. So as a result, you know, I, le I let you know in so no uncertain terms, and you obviously said that you were going to do something about it, and we're in the process of doing something about it and knew that that was the case and and uh and, and and did so so what what are some of the things that you came to understand that you needed to change in order to change not only the program but this specific person's <laughs> attitude towards that program well you know uh it is something that i was sort of expecting uh, what's going to happen uh, when I moved uh, from Sloan Kettering to another smaller place that you probably will not have all the infrastructure in place day one. Uh, it seems like that is unlikely to happen in any discipline if you go from the top of the pyramid to a program that is not yet there. You, you gave some of the statistics before Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson, they are every other year, first or second, or second or first, or first or second. And I wasn't exactly. Sloan Kettering. So if you pick the right year, we were the first. And now you said at Miami, it was 51 by some recent rating. So I think that same rule probably were kicking in here in, in your first encounter. And I knew that there would be a lot of work to be done, but I, I already had a plan in place. And as, as you know, I have worked endlessly and relentlessly, and I am on establishing all those gaps. So to make a long story short, I learned that in order to deliver high quality care, every person needs to breathe myeloma every day. Everyone who is involved in the program needs to understand why this person's job is important and needs to understand what the real mission is for the entire program. So you need to understand the big picture and you need to understand why your role is important. So you cannot have people doing a lot of different diseases or covering a lot of different jobs. You have to have people very specialized and working as a team. It's teamwork, 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 teamwork. Working together, communication, teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. And this is something I learned at Karolinska, I learned about the NCI, I learned it at Sloan Kettering. So when I came here, I, I mentioned already, I brought a lot of people because a lot of the people I worked with, they already knew these things. So I didn't have to train them on this. I just put them here, I offered them these positions and they just started working day one. And they immediately start communicating with each other and me in a way that we used to do in New York City. So it's basically part of New York City moving to Miami. We just get going right away. I think a lot of people here are not fully integrated in this model. They are fantastic people here. They are very hardworking. They are very good people. But the model that was here before was more of a generalist model. And we bring to a table a super specialized model. We're like excellent, center of excellence model. So we have people answering the phone that only do myeloma, scattlers that only do myeloma, nurses, doctors, nurse practitioners that only do myeloma. And we have internal uh, collaborators on the team, say in radiology, pathology, laboratory medicine, and so forth that are dedicated to support the myeloma program. Of course, they did that before also, but I think maybe there were like multiple people that did that for a little while supporting the program. Now we have people that are very, very focused on these jobs. And that takes me back to what I said before. In order to do that for even a large population of patients, you don't need hundreds and hundreds of people. You could do it with a relatively small group, but you need to understand that it's about focus and attention to detail and dedication. And that's really the model I'm rolling out. So we are creating- And you talked, about, you talked about communications too. And that was one of the things 
that I had noticed. And when you say generalist, and that was kind of, I called in on the same line that somebody called in about a cold, you know? And if you've got a, a myeloma patient who is spiked at 103, you know, he, they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily want to go through this generalist uh, uh, rigmarole in order to get to their uh, doctor. And, uh, and obviously that's where you've changed it and changed it the most, which I, I, I congratulate you for that because uh, frankly, it's, it's frustrating for me. And if it's frustrating for me, it's frustrating for all myeloma patients. You wanna call somebody who knows about your disease. You, they they wanna know that they're gonna be able to uh, talk to a, a, an inside nurse or an outside nurse or somebody else who's gonna know exactly about their disease and they want their doctor uh, to, to also be available, you know, if they need it. Because it's, it, you know, the problem with myeloma is you can get a cold one day and be dead the next, you know? So that is, you know, and, 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 and the same thing goes uh, with, uh, you know, that COVID-19. So, it, you know, and it's happened to a number of people that I know, so. Uh, but you're in the right location. There's a bunch of old people in uh, in Florida. I mean, you you've got a quite a good nest there. <laughs> well, uh, as as I mentioned before, Florida is the third most populated state in the in the United States, as you know. Uh, and uh, just here in the Miami area, unfortunately, I think there are close to one thousand people being diagnosed with myeloma every year. So I think we are here to help and support. Uh, I think what you mentioned before, when you called in, uh, I think the line that they used to have was not for everything. It was a line for blood diseases, but that also is not good enough. So you cannot have patients with lymphoma or leukemia or MDS or myeloma on the same phone line, because these are just so dramatically different diseases. So it has to be one phone number from day one that is the number that you can call and the people that answer will know you, they will be able to solve your problems, they work as a little cell. And I learned this, I learned this the hard way in New York City. I think my years in New York City, they, they were very, very intense years. I love New York City very, very much. I think one of the uh, experiences that I have there is that everything goes so fast in the city. So I think in one month, to some degree, you probably get 10 years of work experience elsewhere. And I was there for seven years. So, so if you multiply that, that's a lot of years of experience. So it goes very, very fast and everyone is on everything. And I'm so grateful for the experience I have and all the friends and colleagues I have. And I, I talk to all the time at Sloan Kettering. They, they taught me so much and just seeing how the machine there runs top of the line in everything. That's something I will have with me forever. And I'm trying to establish yeah. that here in Miami. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's, you know, the consistency and the handoff, you know, it seems, you know, there's, there, this, is, this is really a, a race for the myeloma patient, you know, to make sure they get the best of care. And to me, people were dropping the uh, baton just entirely too much before. And so now that you've taken care of that, that's, uh, I think that's, a, you know, a, a, a monstrous step and other places could learn from that. If they took away anything from this presentation, other myeloma centers could learn from that. I think that there are a lot of small pieces that go into what you are bringing up and I 100% agree with everything you say. I think, for example, uh, if you are a patient, you come to a center, you do a blood test. The blood test is important for decision-making. If that blood test takes many, many days to result, the decision-making will be delayed. Or if it's not 100% perfect, that could be potential gray areas for interpretation. So again, I was trained in New York. In New York, everything happens very fast. You, you drive a car, it's red light, it turns green. Everyone honks because they want to drive now. So you have that with you, you come to another place. So I looked here and said, so tell me about the results for this and that assay. And they said, it takes about a week. I said, that's not okay. I'm used to 24 hours, but I give you 48 hours. So you don't have to rush, but not more than 48 hours. And I'm gonna check everything and make sure the quality is up to this level. And we have already, I've been here for about 11 months. 
We have replaced all the instruments uh, for all the MOD testing. We are setting up all the new technologies that we set up in New York for blood-based MOD tracking. We are taking all the newest molecular imaging here. And I would say we probably have, if not one of, maybe the most advanced uh, sequencing uh, program for myeloma in the US, maybe in the world uh, here. So we've taken a lot of these technologies that basically are in our heads with us. And we set everything up and we bought all the instruments. We set up all the infrastructure. Now we are moving fast, fast forward. So that's kind of what we're doing. Okay. Now um, you say you have, uh, you're looking to develop a top class translational research myeloma program. But I think you said there's more than just myeloma. It was, uh, it was other cancers as well, right? What, 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 you know, for, for the uninformed like me, what is a top class translational research myeloma uh, program? So are you referring to all the different diseases or are you referring to a top class? I'm, I'm pretty myeloma? much, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, myeloma specifically, but you mentioned that you're doing it for all diseases, right? Well, uh, yes and no. Well, so I do, uh, I am responsible for everything that relates to myeloma here at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. So that includes the clinical care, the establishment of the whole program, the rollout of all the basic science and also the clinical trials and the drug development. So that goes from the far left to the far right or from the far right to the far left. We cover everything for myeloma. That's my responsibility. And for that, I have hired a lot of people that were already people when I came, but I hired very many people here and we have been growing very fast. So the translational component refers to the fact that you, you provide top of the line care along the lines of what we have been spending time talking about. But then sure. also on the, back, on the back end of that, it's a matter of learning from, from data that you can capture. So if patient consent, they can consent to say, have some leftover blood samples or bone marrow samples or things like that, or imaging pictures we have taken. If the patient agrees, we could then use that for research and we could use that to develop new, better ways to do things, new blood tests. We could do blood-based MOD tracking, for example, or imaging that could be targeted or things like that. All those things are translational. So it refers to the fact that you use science as a tool and you link it with clinical outcome and together they can deliver stronger kind of predictors of, of the future. So we want to find a cure. We want to improve survival. We want to limit toxicity. We want to improve quality of life. And in order to do that, you have to gather data. You need to know how to gather it and analyze it and take it to the next level. So that is really what the translational is. My other job is that I'm leader for the experimental therapeutics program. And we also uh, calling it internally the experimental and translational program. So that really is a program that is intended to help all the other disease areas to do the same. So my role is to oversee that for the entire cancer center. But of course, I cannot do all the work for all the other disease areas. But I'm showing through myeloma how it can be done. And there are already people working with me from leukemia, from lymphoma, from some of the soft uh, or the solid tumors. There are other disease areas that are not blood-based cancers. There are a lot of smart people here that have been working on similar things or related things. Uh, and now we are trying to learn from each other and see how we can help. So my role there is to make sure that they have access to infrastructure in a similar way. So I can help them by showing how we have done it, or I can learn from that and try to cross fertilize. So it's more of a kind of a leader program, a leadership role in that program, but not an operational role to do all the work. Okay, well, that sounds fantastic. You get the same level of patient centered and, uh, and disease focused uh, um, program, uh, which sounds great. Now, myeloma happens to be a very complex. I mean, you, uh, anybody knows that. I mean, 
I remember a story that you once, well, not a story, it was uh, uh, an, you know, something that you once told me and, and that was that uh, you were thinking about what specialty to get into and, and you had a mentor and your mentor told you, well, make sure it's not myeloma, you know, because uh, nothing has happened in myeloma for the last 30 years. So, you know, it, it, there's, there's, not, there's gonna be nothing there for the next 30 years. To which you said, sounds like a perfect opportunity to improve. And I thought that was pretty remarkable. Now that's a set of guts. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's exactly true. And there was actually another disease I was warned about, and that was the chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So it was myeloma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. In, I, the, very yeah. beginning, in the very beginning of my uh, research at the NCI, I was doing a little bit of chronic lymphocytic leukemia research, and we actually published uh, many years ago. I was the lead author in a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, where we show that you can identify precursor clones in patients who develop chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is the precursor of that disease, similar to MGUS being the precursor of myeloma. So I guess I, I ignored both those pieces of advice. I was doing both of those two diseases, but I had to pick one of them and I decided to pick myeloma because I saw that that was that was something that was kind of telling me you have to come here. So I was just going there. I was drilling every day into that, and I still do every day. I, I you know I still am uh, just often amazed at the at the uh, uh, level of expertise in the myeloma patient or in the myeloma uh, specialist community, like yourself and Barlogi and you know, Jagannath and Orlowski and Richardson, and you know, you go on and on and on. You know, these, these are some outstanding uh, individuals. And, but Dr. Barlogi, for example. So, you know, I'm, I'm truly amazed at how, you know, you, it's like, you know, give me a tough problem. And then what happens is that the best people you know, are attracted to somehow tackle that problem. And with that, myeloma life expectancy has gone from like three years when I was first diagnosed to over 10 years. And if you're with a myeloma specialist, that would be the least it would be. Probably, you know, 15, 20 years for that matter. So it's, it's pretty amazing um, uh, that uh, of the skill and the expertise uh, for uh, the myeloma uh, uh, um, clinics, but you know there's there seems to be that disconnect that I find when I go to one that I really love and, and follow somebody into it, and that is that continuity that you've been working on, that uh, that uh, that you uh, took to Memorial Sloan Kettering, that was brought to Mount Sinai, and that uh, Bart left. Uh, you know, from uh, the, the MD Anderson and took to UAMS, which was not your center of the universe. But, uh, so um, how do you organize and develop a center of excellence for world-class myeloma clinical care? Well, I think I, I have all these years of experience from different places. I have the Karolinska experience. I have the NCI experience. I have the Stone Kettering experience. I kind of integrated those in my head. And I kind of try to see what worked the best. And my conclusion is having a very small group. You have a doctor, you have a nurse, you have a nurse practitioner, you have a pharmacist and you have a patient coordinator. There are five people. They work together every day and new patients come to the coordinator who schedules the patient. The coordinator collects the information that the clinical team needs. The clinical team knows exactly what to do and they talk to each other all the time. And when the clinical team says, we need to do these tests, or we need to do this follow-up, or we need to prescribe these drugs, we need to do these things, the coordinator makes sure that all these things happen. So if you have such a small group, it's like five people, 
they can see many patients in one day, in one week, in one month, in one year. As the program grows, you build another team exactly the same way. Uh, you have the same exact uh, uh, unit. And if the program grows even more, you have a third group like this. And as it grows more and more, you would have the same structure. So it's about scalability. So what would be a mistake in my experience is to have many doctors working in parallel and covering for each other just to catch up. You need to keep that detailed attention and you need to have the close relationship with individual patients and the team. And I, when I was in New York, I came there, we had less than 2000 visits when I started there. And when I left, there were over 10,000 visits for multiple myeloma in one year. And I built that program this way. I hired people like this. And as we hire new doctors, the first day they may not be as busy. So sometimes they could share a nurse with someone else or a coordinator. But I always made sure that when the coordinator answered the phone, that that was a unique telephone number to that doctor. And the coordinator would say, say welcome to Dr. Johnson's clinic. Even if, if that coordinator covered Dr. Anderson, he or she could say, welcome to Dr. Anderson when the other number calls. So there are two different numbers. And it was, could be the same person. As, as the volume grew, I would hire another person. And we grew so fast. So we basically had individual cells like this. And I think the quality was the same within each of these cells. And we could probably scale it up even more. In New York, there are a lot of patients. So I think here, we have already grown. When I came here, there was one myeloma doctor. I became the second. I hired a third. I hired a fourth. I hired a fifth. And I have number six starting in less than a month. And I'm already now building these small teams this way. And this is how I'm kind of changing the culture around myeloma. And I use this as a model uh, for uh, building a center of excellence within a disease group and sharing this through the experimental therapeutics program, also for the other disease areas, so they can also see how they can, can do the same thing. And I think everyone is already seeing how well everything is, is going for us. Well, thank you very much. So it becomes obvious, you know, be, given how, uh, how complex this disease is, that it takes a great myeloma specialist and an integrated patient-centered system to ensure the best myeloma care. So uh, how do you attract and recruit this new group of ambitious uh, researchers and clinicians to uh, follow your lead? That's a very difficult question. I think uh, my interest in science goes from the very beginning of med school. I, I was very interested in science, the entire med school, the entire residency and fellowship, and I continued having a strong interest in that. And I'm a strong believer that if you, if you think about things in a new way, you're kind of fearless, you don't kind of get stuck in old ways, you're thinking how you can improve and don't get stuck in old technologies or old paradigms that were never proven by data, that you can really make things better. So I'm looking for people like that. And I am constantly looking who to recruit. And I can tell you already here in Miami, I've had many, many, many talented people reaching out from top places, Harvard, all the New York institutions, people have reached out to me, Mayo Clinic, I mentioned uh, places on the West Coast. People are, I think people that are uh, driven and ambitious, they are looking where could be a good place for me. So if you have this relationship, you share resources with each other. As a leader for the program, I try to be very generous. I also try to be very direct and say, this is what I expect. So I expect that you develop these things. And if it doesn't work uh, for various reasons, sometimes the resource doesn't work. We need to talk about what escape routes that could be. So I, I, I give people one, two, and then three projects to work on. And I try to protect them so they have the resources to move forward. And I've done it for many years, as you know, I've been, 
I've been a doctor for almost 25 years now. So I, I try to share my resources, my knowledge, my funds, my samples, everything I have control over, like a family, I, I share with everyone. But in return, I expect people to drive forward, to build their careers, and also build the program. And then I have one-on-one -on -one meetings with everyone every week. So I spend a lot of time mentoring people. So I know what everyone is doing. And if people are kind of starting to do things that could potentially have some collision with someone else, I would say, we need to talk, the three of us, so we can sort out, or this person has now a new idea, and this person, I think, is thinking about it. Let's, let's talk about how we can work together and help each other. And no one can say everything is mine because we are working together. So I try to also to foster the culture that if something is very important to someone that you should let go. But if someone always says it's very important, that's not okay. You have to be able to say it's not important. So it's kind of a generous culture of discipline and hard work that through mentoring. And I try to set the vision of what's important. Everything is for patients. Improve patient outcome, looking for a cure, minimizing toxicity, trying to go after those important questions that can take us to that goal. So it's a lot of work and it's almost like raising a family. I don't think you can write down like how do you raise a family in the best possible way. And I think it's the same thing when, when you lead a team, how do you do that? It's just like a, it's a lot of work and you, you have to just be generous. I think one of the things I've noticed in you is that you are a change agent. You know, you don't settle for the status quo. My whole career in uh, distribution operations and engineering, um, you know, and in, in, in business management, that uh, I was a change agent. And I can tell you, being that, you're, you're, you're like, you're always, uh, you got your head above the trees, you know, type of thing. You're always, uh, out in front, and uh, and and people don't necessarily like change. They kind of like the status quo, and a number of them do. And as a result, um, you know, you're always a target. And uh, I've seen you as a target a few times. So uh, when you went after MRD, great big, when it wasn't even uh, hardly uh, uh, looked at. When you talked about uh, you know hitting uh, 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 patients when they. Uh, first got, uh, you know, high risk smoldering, you know, and they worked with, uh, you know, the folks uh, with regard to that. And that, God forbid, you did something like actually took a look at actual data and tried to draw conclusions from that actual data, at, you know, millions of points of actual data versus 100 or 200 points from a clinical trial, you know, that you, know, you got your you're, you know, you've got people were taking shots at, but I don't understand it, but they did. And I, but I do understand it. If you change, you're gonna, you, you, it's not, you know, if you're, if you're not doing the status quo, if you're changing stuff, you're gonna get criticized. It's just, it just happens. And, and for, for you, I, I applaud you for it because you're, you're probably in, 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 in an industry you know, in medicine where, you know, the gold standard is what clinical trials are. And to me, I consider that the old standard. It's just not enough data. And you've got all this data out there and you tend to mine it and, and the best do, I think. So thank you for that. Um, now, given what I, I just, uh, said is, uh, is, is there any parting comments that you'd like to share with the audience or comments on the support you've been getting uh, with your efforts and how very important getting this support is for the program's success? Well, I, maybe some last points on my end is that uh, my ambition uh, is the same as it has been the entire time uh, in all the other programs I've been is to develop very, very sophisticated top of the line care for patients and to make sure that we always stay relevant uh, by coming up with new ideas that are relevant, that are important, that are clinically important. 
So always having that kind of uh, motion going, deliver to patients and to, to seek new ideas and to, to challenge ourselves with data and to make sure we always deliver to patients. That, that's really what I was very important to me. I think the, the only pieces we have not talked about in that vein that are important is that it's not only about like developing models. I also wanted to make sure that all these things are available. So I changed the culture here already from having patients calling and they can be scheduled in several days or weeks here. We have to see all patients within five business days at the most. If anyone calls here, if we have the best program, we also have to be able to deliver it. So that's important. And also in that same is that doable? I mean, some places yes. you call for somebody to, to see somebody and uh, it's like three months or four months. I, well, it is possible. But uh, of course, if people, let's say, if someone want to come and see me and challenge what I just said, uh, I will say yes. But there, of course, will be a limit to what I can do. I, I, on Tuesday this week, I think I had six or seven new visits in one day on top of all the follow-ups. So it's a lot of work for me. But that's what I do because I want to deliver. But if I keep on being more and more and more busy, and this is what has happened to me in the past of other places, former chief of myeloma from the NCI, he's here. I hired a top specialist from Sloan Kettering. He is here. So these doctors can also see patients and they are fantastic. I, I, I reveal a secret here that there is nothing I know that they don't know. So, so we do the same thing. We, we, we do the same thing. And of course, we are different individuals. So that's something that will always uh, remain. But from a knowledge perspective, I think we are very, very similar. And also, we work as a team. So we would review cases uh, as, as a group. Every Thursday, we go through cases. And if patients want to be discussed, and they have one doctor and ask the team to see his or her case. We do that internally every Thursday also. So this is part of the scalability where we, we can ensure access, rapid access, top quality, and we have a scalability factor. You cannot copy people, but you can copy the model and you can build a strong model. But I know this works because we already did it and we, we were able to just build this way uh, in New York. It was very, very successful. Okay. Yeah, and, and I know that you've uh, taken some of the people that I have suggested uh, see you that because you did telemedicine and uh, they were just so pleased to have a quick response from you. So I think that's, you know, to think that you can get in in five days with a world class myeloma specialist is just almost beyond belief. But, you know, if you can make it happen, you know, that's that's. That's a remarkable advantage over anybody else who's, who's doing it today, or pretty much anybody else that's doing it today. And I thank uh, you, uh, Dr. Langren, for this. I think it's, um, it's obvious uh, to me that it takes more than, you know, to me, it, to, to begin with, it was, man, if you don't have a myeloma specialist uh, giving you care, you're in big trouble because they're the only ones that could possibly keep up with um, what with this um, disease, myeloma. They're just just too much going on, especially now. Um, but there's also another component to that which is very important, and that's the uh, uh, continuity of care and uh, and having a patient centered. Um, and, uh, and, and disease-centered uh, program. And uh, you've, you've been uh, excellent in providing us with that, um, with your experience doing that. And I think it, you know, if, if people uh, who have their own myeloma programs um, view this uh, particular presentation that they'll, find that there's some nuggets in there that they can bring back to their program to improve their success. And uh, it, it, it's only something, if duplicated, can be um, 
can improve myeloma life expectancy uh, significantly greater than it is today, because we know that the uh, uh, SEER data for myeloma still says there's only about five or six year uh, life expectancy. And uh, when we know that the excellent myeloma centers can provide uh, two to three times to four times that level of care. So Dr. Langren, thank you so much for everything that you do and for success with uh, your efforts at Sylvester in, in, in Miami. Thank you very much for having me, Gary, and thank you so much for those kind words. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.